hi everyone. Um, I'm Stacey Hunter, the director of Local Heroes. And Local Heroes is a curatorial agency connecting audiences internationally with contemporary design and craft from Scotland. Thank you so much for joining us during our first ever New York City Jewelry Week and for celebrating Still Life's exhibition with this special event. I'm just going to share screen. Okay. And we created Still Lives as a play on the tradition of still life paintings. And so each composition in the exhibition was specially created for each of our jewelers individually. We hope you like them and we're so excited to have them be part of this completely amazing and completely virtual jewelry week. We are all joining you from Scotland um, and the local time here is early evening. It's already dark and some of us may have cocktails. And as the curator of this show, um, I'd like to thank Ebba Goring from the Incorporation of Goldsmiths for partnering with me. It has been incredible. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our designers for being part of this live New York City and Scotland link up tonight. And um, these sets that I created with chalk plaster, I think are a really interesting way to present such an eclectic mix of pieces um, from fine jewelry through to art jewelry. And I can't thank our photographer, Gabriela Silvera enough for capturing the look that I wanted to achieve. And a shout out as well to Elaine Simic too in New York um, for his fabulous photography masterclass that our designers participated in. And of course, to our funders at Creative Scotland. I'm just going to put the exhibition link in the chat now for you. Um, and so that you can view afterwards and you know you can all shop the entire collection directly from our designers via that link and can I encourage all of you watching at home to please use the chat function in the zoom um, to send me your questions for the Q&A if you have some we have 20 minutes at the end of this event for Q&A and we can either pass the mic to you so that you can ask the question yourself or you can type your question into the chat room and I can ask the question read that question out on your behalf. And you can also ask our artists to hold up a piece of jewelry and you know, bring it up to the camera for you to have a better look. So you can send messages to me in the chat to ask me to do that too. Um, so yeah, now I'd just like to ask my colleague Eva to introduce herself, thanks. Thanks, Stacey. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Eva Goring. I'm director of the Incorporation of Goldsmiths here in Edinburgh. Um, the Incorporation of Goldsmiths is the, one of the oldest companies in Scotland. Um, we're over 500 years old, um, so we started out in uh, 1492, uh, and we still carry on doing what we did then, which was trade as the Edinburgh Assay Office. So that's where everything is, uh, articles of precious metal are tested and hallmarked. Um, here in Edinburgh, we're one of four um, UK assay offices, um, and we're the only one in Scotland. Uh, alongside our work at the assay office, our charitable trust um, support and promote um, jewellers and silversmiths who live and work in Scotland through a number of programmes and projects, so exhibitions, uh, educational programmes, workshops, mentoring, um, other grants and awards. Um, and in 2017, um, we launched our ethical making programme. Um, our ethical making resource came about from collaboration with renowned jeweler Uta Decker, um, the Fair Luxury Group in London, and uh, Peter Oakley, who's uh, a reader at the Royal College of Art. Um, we worked together with them to create an open access resource for jewelers, um, from students right through to professional makers and consumers as well. Um, you can go to that. I'm going to put it in the chat in a minute, but it's www.ethicalmaking.org. Um, so do go and have a look. Um, alongside the resource, the other part of our program is our ethical making pledge. Um, the Incorporation of Goldsmiths developed this in partnership with the Scottish Art Colleges. Um, so there are several Scottish Art Colleges teaching jewellery and silversmithing at diploma level and above. And all seven signed our pledge back in 2018. And uh, the pledge includes a um, transition to procuring um, ethically sourced metal. It includes um, teaching ethical making as part of the curriculum. Uh, it also includes uh, more responsible and sustainable workshop practices. Um, and to support the pledge, we also have two student ambassadors from each college 
Uh, and it's actually really wonderful because um, Michelle Curry, who is one of our exhibitors, was one of our ambassadors um, at, from Glasgow School of Art, and she just graduated this year. So it's wonderful to see um, new makers in Scotland graduating from a place of knowledge about ethical making. Um, so as they start their journey in their practice, um, they've already had that kind of groundwork knowledge about being more sustainable and responsible. For, for us, ethical making isn't an all or nothing approach. Um, I think many makers that we spoke to found it very overwhelming um, to kind of see it that way. So we really just talk about ethical making as a journey. Um, and, you know, it takes, uh, you know, for us, this exhibition, um, for example, we wanted to have makers who had made a commitment to ethical making, and our minimum requirement was 100% recycled precious metal. Though, for example, Alison McLeod has um, long been on the fair trade goldsmith scheme and spoken at our annual symposiums and been a great advocate. Um, I was a jeweler myself before this and uh, she definitely encouraged me to join that fair trade goldsmith scheme. So we have, uh, our makers are on all different kind of parts of that journey. Um, and for us, it's not just about procurement of metals. Um, it can be about your packaging or your, the chemicals that you use in the workshop and how you dispose of those. I think um, historically jewelers have been very uh, resourceful at recycling. You know, we wipe down our jeweler's bench to get every last speck of gold dust or send off our carpets in the workshop to the refiners. Um, and so it's, it's a kind of a natural progression for us to be looking at ethical making. Um, I thought it's really exciting to see uh, innovation as well. Um, certainly in Sylvia Weidenbach's work, we're seeing um, 3D printing and platinum powder, which is traditionally a very difficult metal to recycle. So it's great to hear more about that. And I know that Swazi has also been looking at um, now moving to fair mined gold plating. Um, there's a Plater's in the UK that's just started um, offering this service. Um, so that's also really exciting. Um, without further ado, I think I'm going to move on and introduce our uh, exhibitors. And um, I think first up is Swazik. So um, Swazik, could you tell us more about your work? And I think Stacey will show some images from our exhibition. Hi, thanks a lot, Eva. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Swazik. I'm a French Scottish jewellery maker based in Glasgow, Scotland. I'm uh, really excited to join New York Jewellery Week today with such a brilliant group of women and makers from Scotland. Uh, the work that I have in the Still Lifes exhibition is all from my Aesthetica collection, which explores geometry and art, rotating movements, and principally the circle. The collection drew initially from a book uh, by Bruno Minari um, called Discovery of the Circle. One of my favourite references actually from the book, which I think speaks better than I perhaps could about the collection, um, is while the square is closely linked to people and their constructions, to architecture, harmonious structures, writing and so on, the circle is related to the divine. A simple circle has, since ancient times, represented eternity, since it has no beginning and no end. I use both traditional and contemporary making processes, and I'm really drawn to modernist design and pieces that are long lasting. My practice is very much rooted in slow design and making feminism and anti-capitalist consumer culture. It's really important to me to consider carefully the impact my work and where it comes from has on people and the environment. For some years now I've been using fair mined gemstones, fair trade gold and recycled silver um, because of those considerations. I also regularly recycle and remake heirlooms, uh, modernizing symbolic pieces, which are passed from generation to generation. I have three Aesthetica pieces here with me, which are exhibited in still lifes. The pendulum earrings, which I'm wearing, 
apologies, my camera is pretty grainy, but you can see kind of scale and swing off in there. They're actually detachable, so, so you can wear the studs as a simple circle, or you can attach the swinging part here. And the torque ring, which is, I'll hold up. So this is hand-drawn gold, fair trade gold wire. And it's kind of a nice everyday, or I like to think of it as a, a nice everyday piece, which like I, I tend to like jewelry that you can play with. And so I tend to throw this around pretty constantly all day and you can have the gap visible or you can hide it. Um, and lastly, the uh, rotating circles brooch, which is a kind of, I suppose it's more of a sculptural statement piece. And uh, the circles here rotate, they're, they're um, riveted on to frame on the back here. And they rotate so you can change the, the engraving and where that sits on the actual circle surfaces. And it kind of looks like a pair of glasses, which I quite like. Um, so that's my, my three pieces from the collection. I'm so delighted to have been part of the Still Life's exhibit and to, to be, again, as I say, amongst this brilliant group of women makers. So thank you again to Emma and Stacey from Local Heroes and, and Corporation Goldsmith. And thank you. York Jewelry Week for having us. Thank you, Sazi. That's really interesting and lovely to see your pieces. Although we don't have, um, you know, sometimes it's hard seeing things close up. Um, do you have a look at the exhibition? You see some beautiful um, close up images of those pieces. And, and it's really nice to get a kind of sense of scale um, of that work um, here as well. And, and the, the details of the rotations and the, I love the detachable earring. That's great. Um, uh, how do people um, go about buying your work, Swazi? Do you tend to make collections and sell them online or more commission-based? It's more, I would say more commission-based now since I actually made the Aesthetica collection a few years ago. It kind of, um, I changed the way I thought about my practice because I felt like the um, industry cycle of you know bringing out a new collection every year or twice a year was really not for me and actually just really anti my values of, of slowing down design and making and um and having making key pieces that were actually meant to last so um so it tends to be that uh, i do a lot more commission work um, I work a lot with people to recycle metal, for example, that they have recycle heirlooms that mean a lot to them, are quite symbolic, but actually they want to have something more for their taste or, or slightly more um, from based on, on my design work. Oh, great. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Eva. No, on you go, on you go. I was just going to say, um, we've got a question for you, Swazi, from someone in the audience. So we'll come to that at the end. Sure. But just to keep to the schedule, I think I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll move on to Ruth now and we can, and we can come back um, to the person who asked the question. So thanks for the question, Mary. So let's go to Ruth now. I'm going to share screen again so that we can look at some of Ruth's work. Um, so remember to unmute yourself, Ruth. And I think Alex will pin the vid video to Ruth so that, yeah, there you go. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ruth and I'm a, a jeweller based in Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. Um, I trained at the Glasgow School of Art and graduated about five years ago now. Um, and yeah, this is my this is my collection. Um, a lot of the work that I still do has has um, stemmed from the work that I did as part of my degree show at Glasgow. 
Um, so what you see here is my um, my ankle neck piece there, um, and we have a, a brooch called the heeled brooch, and my drum earrings, which I'm actually wearing right now as well. Um, I a lot of my work is inspired by textiles and fabrics, uh, like threads within fabrics, the close-up details, um, but also textile machinery. So if you've ever seen inside of a, a loom, which is a, a weaving a weaving loom, basically a weaving machine. Um, they have all these, they're called the um, the heddle components and it's loads and loads of twisted wires in these great big, amazing industrial machines um, which all the threads go through. And that's where the kind of twisted wire concept, which is sort of a signature part of my work now. Um, I don't know if you can see here, my lights may be a little bit bright, um, but I use all of these little thread components are twisted wire. Um, so it's they, they can take quite a long time to make. Um, they, yeah, I basically use really, really fine 0.5 millimeter wire um, and I twist it with an old fashioned hand drill um, and then basically do loads of manipulating. So that combined with quite traditional um, silversmithing methods like soldering and hammering and everything. Um, makes makes my work, yeah. So everything's quite sculptural. I normally have quite a kinetic, playful element to my work. Most of these things move um, quite nicely. Um, and yeah, a lot of it, um, I basically mainly work in recycled silver now um, and as much as possible with as many components as I can. Um, and sometimes I use recycled gold as little elements or basically if someone commissions me and I can afford to use it. Um, but silver is the main is the main piece. So yeah, um, that's my work. This is the, the ankle neck piece. It's got some really lovely movement. Um, and that, this one probably takes me about, well, probably a, at least a week to two weeks to make because there's just you, so much. Ruth, can you hold that up? Can yes, you hold it up? Sorry. It's okay, just a little bit closer to the camera so that we can see. I don't know if it is it focusing okay. Can mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Perfect, yeah. And how long did you say that takes to make? Probably between one to two weeks. Um, I basically have to make all the little loops which create the frames um, within each section. And then I cut loads of wire, twist it, cut again, uh, form it round. Um, and just kind of have to keep generally going over it and neatening it up. Um, so that's that's quite a big piece. I made a huge titanium one for my degree show. So anytime I do that neck piece now, I've only ever made sort of a couple of them because um, a lot of my work is um, made to order. Um, it, it makes me, I'm fine with making that one now compared to the big, huge titanium one I did. Um, and this is the little brooch. Um, this one doesn't move so much, but it was a kind of concept um, to basically, a lot of my work is very 3D, but I wanted to create a sort of flatter version of it. Um, and this one's got all the twisted wire elements. It's oxidized silver with a little bit of gold there. It's so beautiful. I love that little bit of gold that runs through it. And it was so much fun to capture in the photography as well. Thanks so much, Thank Ruth. Okay, well, I'm just going to um, bring Sylvia in now and I'm going to share my screen again, hopefully. Okay, Sylvia, are you ready? Okay, hello. I'm, I said thank you very much for the invitation and it's quite exciting for me to be in this new virtual setting. And uh, yeah, so I'm quite interested in, in a way, the tradition, yeah, so our cultural heritage but also in the future and what happens now. So what we have now as jewelers or silversmiths in our uh, digital toolbox, yeah, like virtual reality, augmented reality, um, artificial intelligence, haptic devices. So I think that's quite, we are as well quite in an exciting time. And uh, yeah, for me, the question is, okay, what does uh, the treasures for a new age looks like? Yeah? And for me, I try to fuse these two worlds together. So the traditional making, because I also, I'm trained very traditional as a silversmith and goldsmith, but I'm also fascinated about what we can do now, what kind of materials we have available, what process 
we have available to create really volume without weight because as you can see in my jewelry pieces one i wear here already and uh yeah one you can see here and it's i'm not a minimalist as you see and these are brooches very easy to wear hollow inside so you have this kind of exuberant uh, celebration aesthetic and in combination 3d printed moon dust and then traditional stones gemstones silver and uh, yeah here the piece sorry <laughs> i need to get used to the right setting you see a brooch moon dust and a mother of pearl and gold and fancy colored diamonds and I'm also quite in excited to work within, uh, with other people in collaborations, with musicians, with dancers, with actors, and also sometimes with quite uh, exciting companies like the uh, German company called Hafner, who produce this material, platinum gold, which is quite exciting, and also have the where I have the possibilities as a designer, as a creative person, to realize my ideas. Yeah, because um, testing things which are in a classical way quite tricky. So I created this year together with Hafner because they had the fantastic machines and also the platinum gold powder. And as you know, uh, I think Eva said already at the beginning in the introduction, it's in a traditional way, it's very hard uh, or more complicated to recycle platinum, but now to print it in one go, it's very interesting, yeah, because you could reuse the powder again and again. And these are two cufflinks. And the amazing thing is really they are printed in one go. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can see it. I also have the bigger prototype so that you understand what I mean printed in one go. Yeah, so with the movement and the mechanism. And uh, yeah, so maybe this describes or gives you a little bit an insight in my work. So it's this excitement about what happens now and um, yeah, to create um, a new beauty. Good. Wow, thank you, Sylvia. It was really wonderful seeing um, that in the larger scale um, piece. Do you do that with many of your 3D printed things? Do you do a larger scale model as well? or um... So you mean the scale is for you large? Uh, you know, on the for the couplings, <laughs> the model that you had, the kind of ah, okay. okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, it's like at the beginning for me also because I'm a very uh, haptic visual person. I need to understand, yeah, and sometimes I need. And this is also the beautiful thing if you work with new technology, you can zoom in, zoom out quite in a dynamic way, and it helps me to communicate because form colors shapes material is my language yeah and uh, why not using it in different ways to make clear what is the essence and what and and to to explain what i want to communicate also if you work uh, with co in collaboration with people which are not from your field yeah which are not in this lateral thinking so i think it's quite a useful uh, method to use 3D objects or mock-ups, which are a little bit oversized to really make clear, okay, this is what we want and how can we realize this? Yeah, And I, I think that's also a very nice experience if it works, if it's, if it's a successful um, productive outcome. And speaking of um, working in collaboration, it's, it's a nice segue for me to be able to introduce Michelle Curry as our next designer because you are, uh, Michelle is a recent graduate this year of the program at Glasgow School of Art where you are a teacher, is that correct? Yes, sorry, I forgot, I'm also a lecturer at the Glasgow <laughs> School of Art and Michelle was my student last year. Lovely, <laughs> well I'm just going to bring in Michelle's images now for everyone. Okay, thank you Sylvia. Hi Michelle. Hi. Okay, hi. So I'm Michelle. Um, I just graduated from the Glasgow School of Art. Um, and as um, was just said, I was very lucky to have uh, Sylvia as one of my lecturers. She's absolutely fantastic. And 
one of the mottos that I've got from uh, working with her is sort of what would Sylvia do? And that's sort of what happened when applying for this. Um, anytime I think I'm a bit nervous about something, I think, what would Sylvia do? And she was definitely in my head when I applied for this. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today and show my work. Um, this collection here was part of my degree show. Um, obviously this year with restrictions, we didn't have the normal kind of degree show. So really grateful for this opportunity. My work um, is really inspired by my love of science and astronomy. I'm really interested in this kind of under this world, hidden world that goes on that is such a huge impact on our physical world, but not many people talk about it or are aware of what's going on. Um, and it's sort of this year finally sort of started playing out in my, my making. Uh, these pieces here that you see are all made with um, iron. So um, I also work with ferrofluid and other ferromagnetic materials um, containing iron particles. Uh, the one you see on screen just now, that's iron sand. So some of the iron sand that I work with is collected from Scottish beaches. So I use a magnet um, and when the sand is nice and dry, you can run a magnet over it and it will collect all the iron particles. Um, you can sieve that out and then you can use it. And what I love about iron is the reaction it has to magnets. So these structures, these rugged, kind of explosive, expansive um, structures come from the reaction to the magnetic field. So if you hold a magnet underneath the iron, it follows the magnetic field lines that kind of branch out. And I sort of use it as a sort of invisible structure to build upon. So it's like a canvas. Um, I actually paint with the iron. I mix it up with resin. There was a lot of field experiments with the resin, but I've got lots of different ways of doing it um, and finally got in this way of being able to mix the resin and the iron together, use a paintbrush and then paint it on top of the magnet um, with something in between and it creates this form. Uh, when the resin then hardens, you can take the magnet away and you're left with these structures. So that's sort of what I'm working with just now and combining that with traditional silversmithing and precious materials. Um, the piece I'll show you in one of the pictures there was this little brooch here. So again, made with the iron structure and then it has a little morganite setting and with uh, recycled gold. And this year I'm really excited that the incorporation um, is putting a stipend towards um, ethical materials for me this year. Um, I won the Graduate Award at the Incorporation of Goldsmiths Elements um, Exhibition. So I'm going to register for Fair Trade Gold this year. I'm in the process of doing that. And I'm going to use the, the award money to start my um, Fair Trade Gold um, journey, which I'm really, really excited about. The idea of uh, mixing such unprecious materials as iron, um, collected and found, also sometimes recycled from foundries, and then mixing that with something really precious, but also really meaningful. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I do have some other pieces. So I will show you the necklace one. So it's a lot smaller. I um, don't know if you can see that that well. Again, really sort of much smaller, but you can see the silver just glinting in there. So that's a circle of silver. And then that's placed in a Petri dish and then magnet underneath the Petri dish and then painted on top. But the it sort of like gets underneath it as well. So I love the sort of way that you can see bits of the iron coming underneath and over the silver as well. And then another piece that I have is this one here. So this is a little bowl and then inside it, it's like a little lid. You can take it off. And I've got the chain just at the back here, which again, the great thing about using magnets is again, it reacts to the silver and then you can have it separate and then it just like snaps together. So we can wear it like that and then just give it a wee shake and then you can move up and it sort of becomes adjustable. Wow, that's so ingenious. I love that, Michelle. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a wonderful experience. And I just want to say again, say thank you so much for um, having me as part of this. It's been, it's been wonderful, I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Michelle. And maybe we can um, can talk a little bit more about your process during the Q and A. I'm just going to be a real 
uh, really committed to the schedule and move us on to our next designer, Alison McLeod. I'm just going to share some images of Alison's work with you now. There we go. You ready, Alison? Yep. Hi there. My name is Alison McLeod and uh, I am based in southwest Scotland in a rural area, which is actually quite there's quite a, a big creative community round about here you wouldn't have really thought but um it's all quite well supported um and there's lots of events and things down here so uh, i don't feel too isolated um i set up my studio 17 years ago now and um i have been making work since then inspired by um collections of treasures like really I always hark back to going through my mum's jewellery box when I was a little girl um, and sort of going upstairs and going through it in secret and the sort of magical aspect of that and the jumble of it all and all the different materials in there and there was nothing particularly precious in there but um it's all the stories that were attached and things like that and also the secret element of that so i, I i've always been inspired by antique jewelry and museum visits and um junk shops and textures involved there and layers of textures um so maybe about eight years ago now i started to develop my catkin um design which is this kind of fish scale fish scale pattern design which i make i start off each piece in silver and make all these tiny little discs in silver and then layer them all up and solder them together um and then have molds made and get them cast in gold um, and this is the kind of basis of the pieces i've got in this exhibition um three pieces uh the first the these earrings which i call i don't know if you can see them properly there but um brilliant edge studs named after the little row of brilliant diamonds along the top um and then the, the, well these are a one of a kind piece i i have a lot of um pieces which are production pieces and then i do a lot of one of the one of a kind as well um and both are nice to have their own sort of nice elements to them the another piece for the exhibition is this um ring with a kind of scatter of diamonds the catkin design uh, the sort of fish scale design is gradiated so it starts with bigger scales at the top and then goes down to smaller scales at the bottom and there's a scatter of diamonds across um, gradiating down from the top. Um, and then the third piece from the exhibition is this pendant, which is the reflections pendant, where each side, uh, the designs flipped and all of these pieces are made in fair trade 18 karat yellow gold, um, which I started working in fair trade gold. I can't, it was maybe about three or four years ago now. And um, it's been a kind of a journey. And now all of my work is made in fair trade gold, which I'm really happy to be able to do that. Um, and that my suppliers are. Um, the gold is available for me to do that. That's wonderful, Alison. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Stacey's about to move us on to the next person, but uh, yeah, I, I know that you do. You also do beautiful wedding and engagement rings and things like that as well. Do you do um, uh, commission work as well as as the kind of uh, the range that you have there. A lot of what I do is bespoke and um, like Swazik was talking about, I work with people's heirlooms a lot of the time and love the the fact that my work 
is inspired by antique jewellery and all the kind of sentimental value that that holds. Um, it's so amazing being able to bring pieces to life and for it to hold the memory of perhaps your grandmother or um, somebody lost. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And I know um, uh, Alison uses most beautiful packaging for her jewels as well. They all come in these gorgeous antique um, boxes as well. So it's all the way through, um, just beautiful. Anyway, I'll, Stacey, you know who's next, so I'll pass back over to you. <laughs> thank you, Alison. Uh, and finally, um, the last of our six designers um, is Heather Wooth. And I'll just share the screen so that we can look at some images of Heather's work while she introduces herself to us. Okay, thanks, Stacey. Um, so I am a jewellery designer and maker based in Edinburgh. Um, I'm actually talking to you today from my studio in Leith. Um, the work that I've created for the Still Lives exhibition is titled Series. Um, I'm wearing some of it, which you'll see in a moment, um, but it comprises of three pieces. I've got the grid necklace, which is kind of inspired by I guess I really wanted to like evoke that sense of like an Egyptian collar um, in this piece that sits higher around the neck um, and it's kind of full, full of pattern and has really big impact. Um, I have the um, drop earrings um, and the grid earrings as well, but I'll show you them in a minute. Um, so this body of work as a whole really has emerged for me very recently. Um, but it has been kind of developing and fermenting for some time. Um, it was really originally born, um, or the seeds of it were born in a residency that I did last year. Um, I was really lucky to be awarded a month long residency at Cove Park, which is an artist centre on the west coast of Scotland. Um, ahead of my month, I had grand plans um, for what I was going to achieve. Um, but the week before I left, all of my tech broke. So my laptop died, my digital camera died, and the site itself doesn't have really much Wi Fi. Um, so I was basically thrown off balance at the last minute and I was forced to go for this month with very little tech. Um, it was pretty daunting actually, but it really forced me to go really back to basics. And I really spent my whole month drawing um, in the end. Um, I was given this studio, which overlooked Loch Long, the valley and the hills. And I spent my days really watching kind of like the shifting light on the landscape um, and the ever-changing Scottish weather. So for those of you who are based further afield, Scotland has a reputation for being gray, for being rainy and for being pretty wet. Um, but the reality is that this kind of changeable nature um, of the weather can give like really beautiful dramatic um, light and skies. Um, so this kind of found its way into my drawing. Um, I was sitting in front of this scene every day watching the light change. It kind of found its way in through, I've got some drawings behind me, this side, <laughs> as an example. Um, but I was working with methodical line, layers and pattern. And this is really what inspired or what this collection is rooted in. Um, I was really aiming to kind of capture that shifting quality of light um, in the pieces. So these are made of many links and you'll see they kind of shimmer and catch the light um, as they're worn. Um, so it took me some time to kind of translate this language that I'd built up for the drawing into metal. Um, so just behind me here, um, you'll see this series of test pieces. These have kind of been developing over the last few months. Um, I moved to this particular studio in March um, and that was like two weeks before our coronavirus six week lockdown. So I just moved in, I was ready to get started. I had all this drawing and all these ideas um, ready to get working. And I was forced to spend six weeks at home. Um, I wasn't able to get into the studio at all. So again, that was another occasion where I was like really forced to slow down <laughs> and take a step back. 
And while that was like really frustrating, um, I think it was really valuable for me. Um, I'm a maker at heart. I can't, I literally can't stop making. So I took some tools to the kitchen table um, and some of these test pieces, particularly these ones at the top, um, were made at my kitchen table with very simple tools and it really spurred on um, this collection. So while it was frustrating, it was actually like a key point um, for me. Um, so I work generally with silver and gold. Um, I really like to work with like a subtle texture. Um, I feel like my work is very ordered and methodical and this kind of like quite organic texture, um, I mean, it's very geometric. The subtle organic texture gives a kind of balance or like a kind of unruly precision to the work. Um, it balances that kind of regimented order. Um, so the body of work in general is very new. Um, it's all been created in the last kind of um, six months. The development, however, felt really slow. Um, and those kind of setbacks, like the tech breaking, lockdown, really forced me to slow down and take a step back, which actually has been the most valuable thing for me. Um, I don't know how many of the rest of you might run a business, but um, I know that when you're kind of stuck on the treadmill, going full steam ahead, um, you can almost sometimes forget to, I don't know, put energy back into your own work or put energy back into your research and your development and your process. Um, so I found over the past few months that this has kind of brought my work back to something that feels very essential or I don't know, it just feels right for me. Um, so I'm just really excited to bring you this collection um, to New York Jewelry Week just now. Well, we are really excited to have it. It's so nice to have um, have those new pieces and be the first ones to be able to sort of show show them off to everyone, Heather. Um, so we're at the q and part of this event and I'm going to kind of moderate. Eba and I will sort of like scan through the chat here. I think the first question actually was from Mary, um, Mary Ravel. Um, and she wanted to ask Swazig about the materials that were used in those pieces that you spoke, spoke about, Swazig. Hi, uh, hi Mary, thanks for that. Um, so the, the materials I use are really um, metals, um, precious metals, both silver and uh, gold. And I use fair trade yellow gold and also sometimes some fair trade white gold and recycled silver. Okay, thanks, Wazik. Um, we've got a question from Kerry Ann Quick of Material Smithing. Some of you might follow follow Material Smithing on Instagram, um, and Kerry Ann's also part of um, Secret Identity Projects, her friends of ours. And Kerry asks, uh, well, she says, "Wow, I want to compliment you all on the incredible quality of the work. You're thoughtful and talented makers." I would love to know more about what inspired Michelle to run a magnet over a beach. And she has another question too, but let's take that question to Michelle. <laughs> Hiya, thanks so much for the question. Um, it was actually part of my degree show. Um, I was interested in researching and speaking to scientists and I reached out to Glasgow University who invited me to their physics and astronomy laboratories. Um, and showed me around and it was actually some scientists there when I was discussing ways that I could make it more visible. They were talking about gravitational waves and black holes um, and we got onto the conversation about iron and it was actually one of the researchers there that suggested different ways of finding it um, and yeah giving it a go. The first time I went it was very wet and it didn't really work um, but when I went back and it was nice and dry which again doesn't happen very often in Scotland and um, so for anybody who's going to do that's a tip is only do it on a dry day um, and it worked really well yeah. Thank you. Um, I see you've got um, a question from Jess um, Tolbert as well. Um, I don't know whether we want to go over, uh, ask Jess to unmute and she can ask her a question um, to Stacey. Yeah, I think to share the mic, Alex does that. So yeah. maybe Alex can share the mic with Jess 
Tolbert and she can ask the question herself if she's there. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, oh, so incredible. I'm just loving this. Everyone's work is so beautiful and I'm just really amazed by what everyone's done, especially the way that it's been photographed and presented in our virtual world. So I wanted to ask you, Stacy, how you came up with these still life scenes and like what inspired your decisions for the materials for each artist or yeah, like how did you go about that process of making these awesome, awesome um, images? Oh, thanks so much. Um, I had one-to-ones with all of our designers and we talked about the themes underpinning their work. Um, and I wanted to do kind of initially like a sort of diorama for each um, artist. But when I had um, a workshop visit at Chalk Plaster and I saw their materials, the penny just sort of dropped. I was like, I should just do the whole photo shoot here and have this beautiful materiality sort of running through the whole thing. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really pleased with how it's turned out. I think it was like a bit of good fortune, good fate. Um, for me um that 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 i had that studio visit there um thanks for that question jess and maybe we can pass the mic to carrie ann um who had a question for sylvia is it possible to do that hey can you hear me yes hi <laughs> Thanks. Um, this is so wonderful to uh, hear more from each artist and see um, see the work handled. That that really helps with the scale um, to understand, you know, uh, how the how the work would interact with the body. Um, I'm just curious uh, if Sylvia can talk more about what inspired the structure of the 3D printed brooches, and um, I'm curious about some of the choices of how uh, the, the 3D printed structure um, interacts with the, with the goldsmithed parts of the pieces. Thank you very much for your question. Maybe I show you a direct uh, inspiration, which uh, this from a catalog. I had a residency uh, at the Victorian Albert Museum in London and I was the residency of the Gilbert collection, yeah? And if you see this stuff here, yeah? This is what absolutely fascinates me, yeah? To see how you can create, yeah? On a small scale, a kind of paradise. So in a way, it's like everything goes into my mind, yeah? And then I mix it with things what I see when I travel, when I go to museums. So it's kind of also, I'm more a DJ in um, how I um, digest all this information, which I get, yeah? And then I pick and I see elements and uh, yeah, try to translate this into the now. And uh, yeah, so it's very playful, experimental and as well intuitive, yeah, in a way. Uh, when you work with 3D additive manufacturing, in a way it's quite controlled and coded, but I try uh, to really um, um, yeah, approach it from a different avenue, if this makes sense. Yeah, from an artistic mind, with an artistic mind. Does this help? Does this answer the question? Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. Hopefully that does. Um, I, the, uh, Alex, if you could, if it's possible to pass the mic to Mary, Mary, do you want to ask your, you, you had a question for Heather that was a sort of technical question. Do you want to ask that yourself? Um, I was just wondering that your chains are beautiful. Um, and I was just wondering more specifically how they were constructed, you know, whether each individual link is soldered um, or is it um, what uh, it loop and loop? I don't know if that's a familiar term to everyone. Loop and loop construction, where they're more like wo each loop is woven into the other, because um, they they lay so perfectly. They're so wonderful to look at. So I was curious. Okay, thanks, maybe. Um, maybe I can just show you. Maybe that's easier than talking about it. So I'm just going to hold it up to camera. I'll see if I can put something behind so you can actually see. Um, so let's see if this is working. Can you see my screen, Philip Big? I, I can. It's a, it's a little blurry, but I, 
I can see it. Okay, let me see if I can hold this in spot. So everything is soldered, um, basically. Wow. Um, so it lays kind of flat and I've really, for a long time, been kind of interested in chain and working with chain structures. There we go. Oh, now okay. I can see there's a, like actually a an incredibly simple construction. Okay. And um, I'm kind of interested in these kind of spine structures, which have like a degree of flexibility to them, but they also have like a limit as well. Um, so I guess I'm in the process of developing this. So there's lots, lots of samples on my board um, to kind of work in progress. Um, wow. but these are some of the pieces that I've made so far. They're beautiful. Kind of working on a central spine, everything is soldered, so everything is fixed in place. Um, and these are kind of very light and airy when you wear them, actually. Um, they sit really nicely. Mm. Thank That's you. So can you see any more questions? I, I'm, uh, I can't see any more in, in the, the chat. Maybe I'm missing. Um, and how are we doing for time? Have we got time for more questions? Um, yeah, you've got, you've got like eight minutes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, let me just double check. Um, yeah. Just going through the chat here. Don't want to miss anybody out. Well, while, while you're going through the chat, I'll just say like a little bit more. Um, uh, chalk someone was asking who are chalk plaster or what is chalk plaster it's a studio in Fife who which is in the mid to north part of Scotland and they make their own materials and they make um, like architectural and interior design plaster work both traditional and contemporary so I worked with a lot of the pieces that they had in production to place the jewellery on um, and Gabriella Silvera and I um, you know sort of it, it's technically as a lot of you who are jewellers and also photographers at the same time if you photograph your own work you'll know it's incredibly difficult to try to get three items of jewellery um, into one sort of photographic composition well and um, so we set ourselves a tricky task but that was the whole theme about wanting to we wanted to create images that would encourage people to take pause and kind of challenge like the Instagram scroll um, and I feel like I feel like we were successful in doing that so how, how are you going Eva? Um, I think we're um, someone's asking for sharing the Instagram handles so um, maybe we oh, can yeah. pop those up there. Um, any of our exhibitors, if you want to put your Instagram handles in the chat, that'd be fantastic. Um, ours is at Incorporation of Goldsmiths, uh, and then there's uh, Local Heroes as well. Um, it's been really exciting to be able to have this opportunity to show so many different genres of jewellery in one show. I think that's something that I've really enjoyed about this. Um, you know, we've got really kind of conceptual work alongside fine jewellery pieces. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, uh, hopefully we'll get to New York one day. Um, but I think it's been really uh, enjoyable trying to challenge ourselves and work in this digital way. Um, despite whatever co the COVID pandemic throws us is all. Um, and just huge thanks to New York Jewelry Week for having us. And uh, it's been really wonderful working with Stacey and these uh, fantastic makers. So thank you from me. Um, Stacey, have you got anything to add at the end? <laughs> yeah, I mean, thanks to the New York City Jewelry Week team for, um, you know, really encouraging Ebba and I not to, um, not to be put off um, you know, because we wanted to participate um, and then because of COVID, obviously, we couldn't come to New York. And, you know, I really want to thank Bella for saying, well, you know, you could consider taking part as a virtual thing. And we were really all at the very beginning of thinking about what that could be. And then um, actually a little plug, I <laughs> suppose, for an event later on um, this evening, it will be 7 p.m. UK time. Um, Alex will be able to say what time it is in New York. Um, but yeah, the, Bella will be chairing a panel um, where myself and a few other curators who are curating for the digital realm and are maybe doing it for the first time or, you know, or, or not, um, will be having like a bit of a chat. So it'd be nice if it'd be nice if people could join us for that, too. Um, but really, I just want to thank everyone for coming to this event and helping us to celebrate. It's been so nice, like to just 
you know, feel the connection that we've been able to have with um, other jewelers and other designers and curators and editors in America and, and all over the world. And it's just so important for Scotland to take its place in the world as a design nation because we have a fantastic design and craft community here um, and I'd encourage everyone to take a look at myself and Ebba's um, Instagram feeds so that you can really feast your eyes on the very um, very broad range of work from jewellery and beyond that Scotland produces. Yeah wonderful well thank you very much everybody. <laughs> Um, and thanks to the New York City Jewelry Week team for just managing to pull such a brilliant program together. I've loved it. It's been absolutely fantastic. And. Um...